Welcome back to Broxham, everybody, and today we're going to be talking about a tournament winning list, this time covering the Yanari. So when I saw this list, I was really excited because, for one, this list kind of epitomizes everything I've been saying about the strengths of the Yanari post-balanced day slate, and I really did think that that type of army was going to be really strong after the nerfs. So it was actually really cool to see a list like this be successful in a tournament. Now, the thing about Yanari in this edition is we all know that Yanari took a little bit of a hit with the, you know, kind of bonuses that they had as an army. In this edition, they basically only get access to Dark Eldar units, and they don't really have that many benefits otherwise. We all know that essentially what they had last edition was Always Strikes First, which was a very powerful ability army-wide. And they also had access to a lot of unique things like relics and so forth, right, and different warlord traits. Unfortunately, they lost a lot of that when the edition came, so a lot of people were a little bit upset that, you know, the Yunari didn't get the love that they deserved. However, we're starting to see now that Yunari is actually in a prime position to take over the meta. And although I do realize that this is only one example of a successful Yunari list, and a lot of players are saying, well, you know, let's wait and see what happens, right? That's very true, but I do think that the Yunari have a lot of key counters to some of the strongest factions out there, and we definitely saw this on display at this tournament. All right, so let's go ahead and dive right into what we're going to be looking at in today's video. So first of all, we're going to be doing a quick announcement and shout out to Groth Schools Workshop for sending me some Eldar-themed token sets, and I'm going to show those to you guys and, you know, talk a little bit about why tokens are important to have in your games. We're then going to be transitioning and taking a look at the tournament itself. We're going to be reviewing and giving a analysis of the winning Yunari list. And lastly, we're going to be asking the great question, are Yunari going to be the meta way to play Eldar in the coming weeks and months? All right, so let's go ahead and dive right into the shout -out. So first of all, shout out to Grot Skulls Workshop for sending me those free token sets to use in my games. They've been really helpful. I've used tokens for a long time in wargaming. They help me keep track of everything that's going on in the battle. And as you guys know, I really like to, you know, run complex strategies and combinations and things like that. So being able to keep track of all of them and also for my opponent's benefit as well has been a great boon to my gaming experience. And up until this point, I've actually been using War Machine tokens to kind of mark my buffs and stuff like that. And while they're cool and everything, they do require you to use a Sharpie to kind of write down on the token. And that can kind of get messy and it's a little bit, you know, a little bit annoying just because of the fact that you have to continuously wipe off the Sharpie. And by the end of the game, your thumbs and fingers are covered in black ink. So just from a personal perspective, I really did appreciate not having to go back and keep doing that over and over again. Now, tokens are a very important aspect to the hobby nowadays in 10th edition, and that's just because there's so much going on in games, right? You got your opponent's debuffs, you got your own buffs, you got secondary objectives, you know, things like that. You got battle shock going on. There's just a lot of different things to keep track of. And that can get really confusing, right? Especially when you're stacking buffs on a single unit. So I have an example here. These are actually my Storm Guardians I recently painted up and, of course, a Farseer. And leading the unit is Yvrain. And I think there's a Warlock in there, too, that I just kind of threw in. Obviously, Yvrain and a Farseer wouldn't be able to lead, you know, the unit together. But since we're doing a Yanari video, I just decided to throw her in there. And actually, this is a model that one of my subscribers and supporters actually sent to me all the way from Great Britain, if you can believe that. Toys for the Toy God. A shout out to him for painting this beautiful Yuverain model. And I'm going to give you guys closer pictures to that model in my next video, which is going to be covering, you know, our next community project, which is going to be a painting compilation. So stay tuned for that later this week. So as you guys know, Storm Guardians can benefit from multiple buffs. So on this example, we have the Farseer throwing Fortune on the unit, giving them a minus one to wound. And also, as we know, they have sticky objectives, so they have that sticky objective objective secured token. And this is extremely helpful because this tells your opponent exactly what buffs are in each unit. So they don't have to constantly ask you, and it just kind of speeds up the game as well. So we have Fortune on this unit, and then, of course, the objective secured ability that these Storm Guardians come with naturally. 
So your opponent knows that in the command phase, if these guys control an objective, they will make it sticky. But of course, as you guys know, there's more buffs that can be applied, right? It might be easy to remember Fortune and the Objective Secured ability, but what if you need to use Lightning Fast Reflexes on a unit that's already benefiting from multiple buffs? Now, again, because it's your army, you may know this, but your opponent might not, might forget. And personally, on more than one occasion, my opponents have forgotten that a unit is at minus one to hit via lightning fast reflexes or another ability, and they just roll their normal ballistic skill. And sometimes that can get a little bit awkward telling an opponent that they have to re-roll all of their dice, right? So now they don't have to because you have the token on there that says minus one to hit. Your opponent looks over, sees the token, and knows that any shooting attacks coming at that unit are going to be at, of course, minus one to hit. And we can also take this a step further if we wanted to give plus six movement to our unit via Quicken if the Warlock is, of course, in the unit. So as you can see, the buffs that you can actually give to units can multiply very quickly, and this can be confusing for not only yourself in some cases, but also your opponent. So having tokens readily available is an easy way to keep track of these things so that there's no confusion in the midst of battle. All right, so here are the tokens. Now that you've seen them, what they look like next to models, this is kind of what you can expect from the sets. Now, of course, they come with multiples of these, but I didn't want to like have all of them out for you. I was sent multiple sets of these tokens, but you know, these are the important ones that I think, and I'm going to give my honest opinions about them and maybe a couple of critiques at the end on how I think the set can improve. Okay, so here are the pros of the set. And by the way, there's two sets particularly that you should probably look at if you're an Eldar or Dark Eldar player. That is the Space Elves set and the Dark Raider set. They're both specifically designed to work with Eldar and Dark Eldar respectively. And over on the right-hand side, I have some of the most important of the Eldar set. And on the left side, I have some of the most important of the Dark Eldar set. In the middle is kind of for both, you know, just your battle shock and objective secured tokens. Now, what I will say about the set is, first of all, it looks really clean. The tokens look really crisp. The printing on them is really nice. And the artwork on them looks really crisp as well. On the right-hand side with the Eldar set, you have the gems and you have the kind of mystical kind of psychic powers and energy that's flowing through them, which looks really cool, especially next to Eldar units. And then on the left side, you have the Dark Eldar set, which there are more tokens to the Dark Eldar set, but I think those are probably the ones you're going to use the most. And they have a very spiky and, you know, kind of cursed look to them, which is really cool. Now, what I will say also is that not only are they, you know, good in their printing and their artwork, but they're not too big. And this is really important because there's a lot of tokens out there that are kind of too big, right? These are 25 millimeter tokens, so they're really small. They go right next to your models, and they don't take up a lot of space on the battlefield, which is important. Some of the old War Machine tokens that I had were rather bigger, and, you know, those sometimes were getting in the way, I found. So that is another nice thing about these tokens. Okay, so they look really nice. They're light, which is another great thing. That means if they hit your model, they're not going to chip paint off or anything like that. And the artwork's really cool. So what are the improvements that I think could be made to this set? Well, if you go and check out the link in the description, you will find that the Eldar set has basically everything you need, but there are a couple of things that are slightly off that I think should be fixed. So one of the things is the minus three to charge this unit. So it's actually minus two, right? So whether you're using a Night Spinner or you're using a, you know, the Restrain ability from the Warlock, you're never going to be subtracting three from the target's charge distance. It's going to be two. So, you know, two Grot Skull Workshop, I would just recommend that you change that to minus two instead. Also, the Can Shoot and Charge token, I think, should be clarified to be fall back, can shoot, and then charge. Because, you know, you have to be clear with that, or else it just kind of reads like can shoot and charge, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because every unit can do that. <laughs> right so i think you know obviously there is room on the token for that you just put fall back can shoot and charge and then it's perfect and then it matches perfectly with one of our stratagems and several of our unit abilities i also think an eldar token that says advance in charge would be cool right because you know even though it sucks we have the shadow seer 
which can put advance and charge on a unit of Harlequins, and we also have Howling Banshees who can do the same thing. So, of course, I think that both of those should be included in the set as well. Now, as for the other ones, they're pretty cool, right? You got lethal hits, you got ignores cover in there, you got reroll to hit, you got minus one to hit, you got plus one to wound, you got minus one to wound. So you pretty much have all your stuff, right? You have your doom, you have your guide, you have your fortune, which is really useful. And of course, you have your objective secured and you also have your battle shock tokens as well. So overall, I think this is a really cool set. You know, if you just want to kind of have a set of tokens for your Eldar, you just go to the Space Elves token set and, you know, it comes with a variety of different tokens, basically all that you need. And the only thing that to me is a slight bummer about this set is the minus three to charge this unit. And again, it's it's supposed to be minus two, right? But again, you know, if you do use the Warlock and if you are using the Restrained ability, you could just explain to your opponent it's actually minus two or, you know, a Night Spinner or something like that. And hopefully Grot Skull's Workshop changes this so it can be accurate. So yeah, once again, thank you so much to Grot Skull's Workshop for sending those out. I've had a blast playing them in my games, and it's super fun just putting a token down on a unit. It does honestly feel good to do that. I don't know why. I'm kind of a weirdo for that, but it does feel good to put that buff on the unit. And if you guys do want to pick up a set of these, I do have a discount code with the link in the description of this video. Check it out. You get 15% off if you use the link. And of course, it helps support the channel a little bit as well. So, you know, if you are looking to pick up a set of these, definitely look into the Space Elves or the Dark Raiders token sets. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the tournament itself, of course, the subject of this video. So this tournament was the Nottingham Super Major. It took place on February 17th. It went on to the 18th, of course, because it was a grand tournament. And, of course, it was in Northampton in the United Kingdom. The Super Major had 104 players in attendance as well, which is a pretty large showing. It's not the biggest of events, but it is a pretty massive event nonetheless. Custodes took first, unfortunately. <laughs> So I say that, of course, because, you know, as everybody now knows, Custodes are back. They're probably going to top the charts for some time. They were probably tweaked a little bit too much, buffed a little bit too much. I think that, you know, the Feel No Pain against Devastating Wounds alone probably would have been enough to make them competitive again. But, you know, they did get a little bit more than that. So, <laughs> you know, unsurprisingly, they're looking pretty good. However, the Eldar took second and third place, which is pretty awesome. And of course, you know, one of those lists, the second place list, is going to be what we're going to be looking at. So coming in second was Dan Bates with his Yunari, and the only loss he had was against Custodes, of course, at the very end of the tournament. So he went six and one. And let's go ahead and take a look at his list. So his list included Yuvrain, of course, as the Warlord. He also had a Spirit Seer. His other data sheets included 10 Wraith Blades with axes and shields. Of course, the Spirit Seer was joined to them. Three units of Shadow Spectres of five, two units of Swooping Hawks of five, one unit of Warp Spiders of five, of course, three units of five Scourges with Dark Lances, one unit of five Mandrakes, one Harlequin Troop of six with two Fusion Pistols and Special Weapons. He also had three Shroud Runners for those lethal hits and, of course, three Support Weapons with D Cannons. And yes, indeed, it does seem like D cannons are back for a lot of Eldar players. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the list proper and analyze the list unit by unit. So this was, of course, a 2,000-point Strike Force list for the Northampton GT. As for the characters, like I said earlier, he took a Spirit Seer. Now, the Spirit Seer is a character that is mainly just used for the Wraith Blades. Now, the Wraith Blades are pretty tough on their own, but when you add the Spirit Seer into them, it does make them quite a bit tougher, gives them the ability to regenerate a Wraith Blade each turn. And this makes it so that your opponent kind of either has to deal with them at once or, you know, not deal with them at all. Either way, it plays to the advantage of the Eldar player being able to essentially control the midboard much more effectively. Yvrain is also the warlord, of course, because she has to be. And, you know, just basically Yvrain being Yvrain, great devastating wounds damage, pretty good damage in combat as well against infantry. And she will most likely join the Harlequin unit, which with her in it becomes much more durable and also 
much harder hitting. As for the other data sheets in the list, we have no battle line in this particular list, but we have three units of Shadow Spectres. So just as I kind of talked about in the beginning when I predicted the units that were going to be the best in the edition and in competitive play, Shadow Spectres are being run in triplicate here, and that's because they just really just don't need Phantasm to operate effectively. Shadow Spectres are also very good at dealing damage to enemy units, so if you need to blow something up, whether it be a horde or a tough unit like Terminators in the midboard, they can easily do it, especially with the combinations that Dan incorporated in his list. And of course, Shadow Spectres are really good at scoring secondary objectives as well because they're very fast. They're flying infantry that can also move an additional six inches, and on top of that, if they really do need to, you always have that extra fire and fade that you can use if it's in your back pocket. Another interesting point that I want to bring up is the power of the Shadow Spectres in their movability isn't just for objectives and to get out of line of sight for shooting purposes. It's also to create distance when you need to, to prevent getting assaulted. So there's a lot of armies out there right now, like Dark Eldar, for example, that can assault you from across the board, basically on turn one. Having a unit of Shadow Spectres that can shoot you at 24 inches with Prism Rifles and then move back six inches out of that threat range is very important and is key to basically being able to keep them safe. So Shadow Spectres kind of have everything that you would want to in the current meta, right? They have great damage against hordes in case you go up against something like Imperial Guard or Tyranid or anything like that. They also have fantastic Terminator equivalent killing power. So against Wound 3 enemies or even Light Transports, they're very effective against those targets as well. Okay, so moving on to the Shroud Runners. So the Shroud Runners are a very fast unit that is really good at scoring objectives. And most people kind of see them that way and they see the lethal hits buff as something that's nice to have but not necessarily needed. However, in this particular list, the ability to give every single unit in the army lethal hits against the target is massive, right? You have those three units of Shadow Spectres, which if they're using their blast weapons, can absolutely wreck even harder targets with their dispersed shots. On top of this, if you're going against really tough Toughness 13 targets, things like the Monolith or things like the, you know, Shadow Sword or anything like that, you know, the Imperial Guard Bane Blades, then you're going to need lethal hits even with your high strength Bright Lances and Dark Lances. Which is another reason why this list was so successful, right? Even if you're shooting Dark Lances and benefiting from lethal hits on single shot weapons, if you're running 12 Dark Lances between three units of Scourges, that's going to be two Dark Lance shots that go through that you don't have to roll fives to wound against Super Heavies on. Which could mean the difference between downing that Monolith and letting it survive for another turn, which of course can be detrimental, very much so, when going against the Hypercrypt Legion. So overall, the Shroud Runners, I think, were a very good utility pick for this army. Not only are they really good in the objective game and stuff like that, very versatile in where they can move, what they can move block, and things like that, but they're also extremely good at multiplying the army's damage against key targets. Okay, so we also have three D-Cannon support weapons in this list. Now, D-Cannons are back just simply due to the fact that the Night Spinner got nerfed so hard into the ground, and we still need something to exert pressure from out of line of sight. And lo and behold, D-Cannons fill that role. D-Cannons, they are very fragile, but when you're running three units of them and you're running a bunch of other stuff that your opponent has to worry about, the indirect fire that they do have might not be going to D-Cannons every single turn because you have to worry about Swooping Hawks, you have to worry about Mandrakes, you have to worry about Scourges, you have to worry about Shadow Spectres, etc., your opponent is just not going to have enough indirect fire to deal with them in addition to all of the other threats in your army. So while it seems like, yeah, support weapons are very fragile, you have a bunch of other targets that, you know, your opponent has to deal with. So there's a lot of target saturation in this particular list. And D cannons, of course, do massive damage, but they also plug up the weakness that the list inherently has, which is how to get to targets that are going to be out of line of sight and also how to get to targets that are going to be tougher than what Dark Lances and Bright Lances can handle, which of course D Cannons being Strength 16 AP-4 can definitely fix very quickly. 
Also, if the unit is forced to shoot at a infantry target, it does give them a debuff as well. So, you know, it's not the ideal situation, but D cannons are pretty much useful in every turn of the game, even if they're not in range of their ideal targets. And of course, your opponent does have to keep their threat range in mind. Even though it's considerably less than last edition, it is still a 27-inch threat range that your opponent has to be careful of. All right, and moving on to the Swooping Hawk. So we're going to see these in probably pretty much every competitive Elder list, just because they're so versatile, being able to hop around the battlefield, score on objectives via Sky Leap is extremely important to have in your list. And especially in this list where you have so many different threats, you know, your opponent can't easily single out your secondary objective scoring. So what's really interesting is a lot of Eldar players will have, you know, a couple units of Hawks, maybe a unit of Spiders and stuff like that. So your opponent will know that to kind of curb the Eldar secondary scoring potential, those units need to die first. But the great thing about this list is that's basically the entire army. You got Swooping Hawks, you got Scourges, you got Warp Spiders, you got, you know, Shadow Spectres, you have it all. You have Shroud Runners, you even have a unit of Mandrakes who are basically infiltrating Swooping Hawks. So, <laughs> you know, you do have so many of these types of units that it's going to be pretty hard for your opponent to stop that game plan. And of course, Swooping Hawks are also pretty good at dealing with infantry and even sometimes just getting the last couple wounds off on a tough target because they do have lethal hits. So very solid unit overall, you know, one of the best in the index, in my honest opinion, and really not surprising to see in the list as well. Next up, you have a troop with six players and of course the two fusion pistols. Again, this is a unit that is probably going to be with Yvrain. She gives them Feel No Pain 5 Plus, which makes them a little bit more durable. So they can actually, you know, take a primary objective and maybe survive on it because of that extra durability. And of course, if your opponent doesn't allocate the proper resources to killing this unit, which has a 4 plus invul save and a 5 plus Feel No Pain, then Yvrain is going to be able to regenerate D3 troops. And of course, from then on, it's a pretty good unit to punch with, right? It has plus one to wound on the charge. Yvrain is no slouch in combat against infantry. So this is a very good unit. Now, surprisingly enough, the unit does not have a transport. But I actually don't think it really does need one in this list because you have so many other mobile aspects to the list and the role of this unit is basically a counterpunch unit, right? Something hits your Wraith Guard that is going to give them trouble, this unit can come in and deal with them appropriately. Or if you need a unit that can basically slaughter things like Canoptic Wraiths, you have this unit. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, how can this unit actually do good against Canopic Rates? They have an extremely high toughness value, and you know they have their 4-plus invul save. It's going to be extremely hard for a troop to deal with them. And yes, you would be correct, except you are forgetting about your brain's devastating wound ability. Now, it's only anti-infantry, but Canoptic Rates are going to always be joined by an infantry character via the Crypt deck right? They're going to be joined by a Technomancer. And Technomancers give the infantry keyword to the Wraiths. So Yvrain's anti-infantry devastating wound combination actually works against them. So yes, Yvrain can go into that unit and do some serious work and kill a vast majority of the unit. You don't even have to kill the character because the character just being there is giving her such a big buff that she can basically take on the unit almost by herself. But of course, being able to, you know, kind of throw in a bunch of other wounds as well via the troop is, you know, good as well. They do get plus one to wound, which means they are wounding on fours against the Canopic Rates on charge. And in most cases, they are going to be pushing them to a four plus invul save. So it's actually a very strong unit that's quite good into several of the more powerful armies that we're seeing in 10th edition after the balanced data slate. Warp Spiders are also present in this list. Notice there's only one unit. So I think, you know, obviously you can be very successful with multiple units of Warp Spiders. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. Warp Spiders are a extremely good unit and they're still good. I do think they did suffer just a little bit from the Phantasm nerf. That's just my view on it. That's how I saw Warp Spiders getting affected with the latest Balanced Data Slate. But they're still a very powerful unit in the objective game because they're the only unit that can just basically flat out move 24 inches across the board right? So they are a very strong unit as well, even still. And still very much a great denial unit, being able to overwatch with torrent weapons. They're just very powerful, and they're going to remain 
basically a staple in most competitive Eldar lists. Now, the list also has 10 Wraith Blades in it, so this was a little bit of a surprise, but, you know, on further reflection, not really that much of a surprise, because we do still need something, especially in this type of list, where you have a lot of units that can move and shoot, you do need something to anchor the enemy army in place, and this is going to be the Wraith Blades. And of course, a Yunari list cannot take the Avatar of Cain, so what do you take instead? Well, you got to take Wraith Blades, right? Now, the thing about Wraith Blades with the Spirits here, they are a little bit more expensive than Cain, but they also are more durable. They have more wounds, and of course, they still have a 4 plus invul save. So they are going to be able to hold those objectives extremely well against a lot of different targets out there, including, and I know I keep mentioning this, but Canoptic Wraiths, of course, because the Canoptic Court and the Hyper Crypt Legion are both going to be using, you know, melee units that Wraith Blades happen to be kind of strong against. Not necessarily in the damage department, but just the ability to survive their attacks. You know, even if you're not getting the OC on that objective with good positioning, if you use a few fate dice or, you know, whatever to get a good advance roll on the first turn, and then you follow that up, maybe not with Phantasm, but with a Fire and Fade, you can definitely move this unit far enough to be able to get onto an objective and deny your opponent the ability to get on that objective. And of course, if you don't have the melee punch to be able to kill enough Wraith Guard to, you know, get on the objective, you're just not going to be able to control it, no matter how much OC you have. So yeah, Wraith Blades, while they may be considered kind of a mid-tier unit, in this particular army, they fit the exact role that this army really needs to perform well. All right, so moving on to the allied units, of course, the Dark Eldar units, we have Mandrakes. Now, the Mandrakes kind of fit perfectly into this list because not only do they infiltrate and, you know, have the ability to prevent opponents from getting onto objectives early and they can screen for you and stuff like that so that you're not overwhelmed in the early turns, but they're also able to essentially Skyleap, right, with their Back to the Shadows ability or whatever, right? So they can fade back into the shadows and Skyleap exactly as Swooping Hawks can. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of like having a unit of Swooping Hawks, a third unit of Swooping Hawks, but you also gain the utility from the Infiltrate ability. So you don't have to take Rangers and stuff like that. Rangers being a very good unit, no doubt, but not able to fade back into the shadows and come back from reserve. And the other good thing about these guys is they actually have decent melee. It's not the greatest melee ever. It's AP zero melee, but they wound pretty good. So they're good at taking out light targets. So they're good at taking out things like Crute Hounds or scouts, you know, things with not much armor that you can kind of, you know, run into, shoot, and then charge, and then, of course, kill. And they do trade well against those types of units. They're not guaranteed to kill every scouting unit or infiltration unit they come across, but they can do fairly well against most of them. All right, so now for the last part of the list, we, of course, have Scourges. We couldn't have a Yunari list without Scourges, right? And they are the best Dark Eldar unit by far. The fact that they can move, shoot, move on top of being able to carry heavy weapons like Dark Lances makes them extremely potent ranged combatants. You mix this in with the Eldar Detachment bonus that they can reroll a hit roll and a wound roll, and they just become extremely efficient for the cost. Now, these all have Dark Lances. There's no Haywire Blasters or anything like that. Basically, I think that's just because of the area they occupy in the board. Dan probably wanted these to just occupy the backfield. And when you're occupying the backfield, oftentimes you're just not going to have the range with the Haywire Blasters. And of course, there's going to be other units occupying the midboard and stuff like that. So that's that's my prediction anyway. I'm not 100% on that. But that's why I think it is. And also just because you have the D cannons, right? You have stuff that can hurt really heavy targets anyway. So the Haywire Blasters are probably just not as needed in a Gunari list. Whereas, of course, in a Dark Eldar list, on the other hand, you probably do need the Haywire Blasters because, quite simply, you don't have things like D-Cannons that can punch through anything that's higher than Toughness 12. But yeah, that basically wraps up the list. You have Scourges out there at the end, which of course are the best Dark Eldar unit. You do have Mandrakes as well. So you have a lot of very strong Dark Eldar elements of this list, but it's mostly Eldar. There's only a couple of Dark Eldar units in here to bring it all together. All right, so what are my final thoughts on the list? So it's obviously an extremely fast and difficult list to pin down due to the massive amount of move, shoot, move that's in it. And also, you know, there is Phantasm still. It is not great, 
but there's a lot of units in this particular army that can benefit from it as well in pinch situations. So, you know, some moments will come down to luck, but if it's a unit that's really fast coming up the flank that's threatening a unit of Shadow Spectres, and, you know, they have a 7-inch charge, well, even a 1-inch on a Phantasm might actually put that unit out of charge range. So it is still kind of worth it in some situations to use. And this list also hits extremely hard, both against large targets and infantry. It just has tons of firepower. 12 Dark Lances from the Scourges, you know. You have the Shadow Spectres who are dealing a bunch of damage too. You have Shroud Runners, which are boosting the damage of those units even further. And then you have D cannons, which, although fragile, pack a serious punch. So you just have a bunch of fast moving units that hit very hard. And also, you know, something that would normally be lacking in a list like this is its ability to hold the midboard. A list that I had that was very similar to this that I ran a couple times with lots of scourges, lots of shadow specters, basically just a lot of move, shoot, move stuff did not actually have Wraith Blades. It didn't have anything to really hold the center. Instead, it had the Yinkarn. That was basically the choice that I made instead, which, you know, at the time was good, but since the changes, it's just going to be more influential to have a unit that can hold midboard against a lot of different armies out there. Or you're simply going to lose on primaries pretty much every game, and you're going to have to really rely on secondary objectives and, you know, enemy, you know, primary denial to be able to win your games. Which, with the primary objective powerhouse armies like Necrons and Custodes, that's just going to be really difficult to do in the current meta. And also this list, I think it goes without saying, just has a ton of secondary objective scoring potential. Basically, every turn, most of what you draw is going to be achievable. Whether it be Capture Enemy Outpost, whether it be Storm Hostile Objective, whether it be Table Corners, or, you know, quite frankly, Deploy Teleport Homers. Right? I mean, most of those objectives that you draw in any given turn, you're going to be able to score on. So that's great, right? And the list also has enough punching power to score on things like Assassinate and Bring It Down. It basically has everything you would need to score really high in any given game on the secondary objectives. So overall, very powerful list, extremely strong, and I think the one weakness that it does have is covered with the Wraith Blades. And you can definitely see this in the matchup. Actually, you know, Dan, pretty much all of his scores, except for the very last game, were extremely high. It was only in his very last game against Custodes that he scored anything less than 90 points. Yes, you heard me correctly. He scored 90 points or over in every one of his games, except for his only loss against Custodes. And that's saying a lot. Okay, but let's go ahead and talk about that, right? Because it seems like the list's apparent weakness is Custodes. But why? The list has a ton of firepower. Why is it weak against this particular army? Well, I essentially just think it comes down to this. The Eldar probably don't have much trouble in the secondary objective scoring game, but in the primary objective scoring game, they are going to have a lot of issues. And that's just simply because Wraith Blades don't do well against Custodes units. Custodes absolutely demolish them in close combat. They have more objective control and will often just beat them right off the objective as soon as they come on it. So that's one, right? The Wraith Blades just automatically lose because a bunch of damage three weapons pushing them right to their invul save is going to drop them each and every time. The devastating wounds of the D Cannons, Warp Spiders, and Yvrain are also heavily countered by their Feel No Pain against Devastating Wounds Immortals. If this matchup happened before the nerfs, I guarantee you the Custodes would be on the losing foot because they would just have no units. Every unit that went onto an objective would probably immediately get wiped off. By something dealing a bunch of Devastating Wounds like Yvrain, or of course the D Cannons. But since they're getting a Feel No Pain 4 Plus against it now, it's just going to be really difficult to remove them off of objectives once they get a hold of it. Harlequins also charging into a unit with fights first isn't going to go well, right? The Harlequins are in the list as a counterpunch unit to deal with things like that that the Wraith Blades can't necessarily handle. But when the Custodes are controlling that objective, they're getting that fights first, the Harlequins basically just die. And same thing with Yvrain, right? If she goes in there... They're getting the 4 plus Feel No Pain against her Devastating Wounds, and she's really not doing as much damage as she needs to to be able to wipe them off the objective. And that's, I think, really what it comes down to, is just 
you know, custodies are much better on objectives than this particular army is. And especially against Wraith Blades, they just seem to counter that unit very hard. And I do think the Custodes are going to be a struggle for the Eldar to compete against in competitive play just because of their newfound power on primary objectives. And of course, the Eldar are not the strongest army on primary objectives, at least anymore, right? Before the nerf, we could easily compete with Custodes because of the ability to have Wraith Guard, which could just absolutely annihilate entire units of Custodes. And now that Wraith Guard have kind of gone by the wayside, it's just going to be much more difficult to actually deal with that unit. On top of, of course, the buffs that Custodes received as well. So are the Unari going to be the meta way to play Eldar in the coming weeks? Well, quite frankly, you know, I kind of predicted that the Unari were going to be really strong. And I think they're going to be basically the meta army going forward. I don't think everybody is going to play Yanari, of course, because I think just Eldar in general are more popular than Yanari as an army. But I do think that the Yanari are going to have a lot of success in tournament play, even if they're not played at an extremely high rate. And with access to the best units that the Dark Elder have to offer, like Scourges and Mandrakes, and also Reavers, of course, weren't in this list, but are also still extremely good, and a very powerful MSU playstyle, I think they're going to have good matchups into several of the top factions, including Dark Eldar and Necrons. And yes, I do think Yunari have a really good matchup into the new Dark Eldar detachment, right? A lot of their units simply outrange the Dark Eldar, can move back after shooting, pop a Venom, and then move back out of range. And of course, you have indirect fire like D cannons and stuff like that, which, you know, Venoms don't really like. <laughs> Because it's basically a D cannon is going to pop a Venom one for one every turn, right? So you can have six Venoms on the field, but if I have my three D cannons and you can't touch them because you have no indirect fire, it's going to be very hard for you to actually deal with that type of list. And again, like I said, with the Necrons, you have the Canoptic Wraiths, which are really good on objectives, but Wraith Blades can hold their own just fine against them, and Yvrain and Harlequins can easily out-trade canoptic rates on objectives and not only have trade but pretty much wipe out all right so in conclusion congratulations to dan for his excellent performance at the northampton super major that was awesome dude thank you for actually running yunari and having some success with them it's really cool to see that and i think it does prove that you know the eldar especially when sprinkled with some dark eldar in there still have a lot of skin at the game at the highest levels in competitive play there has, of course, been some concern among the Eldar community about, you know, GW nerfing the Eldar too hard. And while I do think the Phantasm nerf in and of itself was a little bit much, I think most of the things are adaptable, right? And I think that most of the reason why the Eldar are doing so poorly in the first weeks of the balanced data slate is simply due to the fact that, you know, a lot of players probably that were on the more competitive side simply moved on. They were playing Eldar because Eldar were really competitive and they were the top faction in the game. And now that they're seen as, you know, not the top faction in the game, there's other strong factions as well. Those players have, you know, jumped ship, <laughs> so to speak, which, you know, it does make a lot of sense. I, I knew that the primary reason Eldar were so prevalent in the tournament scene over the last couple of months since the arrival of 10th edition was because they were very strong. And of course, as we all know, the meta chasers will meta chase and they will chase whatever army is best. So I think that's the primary reason we're seeing a vast drop in win rate. But as it goes on, I think we'll see a more stable win rate. I'm thinking around 50%, but we'll just have to wait and see. I think we'll know more in a couple weeks where we stand. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. Thank you for watching, and thank you so much to all my patrons and supporters who have supported the channel over the last year. Your help has greatly improved the channel and helped it grow significantly. If you do want to join the channel and help support it, I have free trials activated, which will grant you permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategy, tactics, and, of course, hobbying. I will leave the link to our Patreon in the description. I'm also an Amazon affiliate and have a channel store page, and I will leave those links as well, just in case you want to grab some Eldar-inspired apparel or some discounted Eldar miniatures on Amazon. Also, one last shout-out to Grot Skull's Workshop for sending me those tokens. Thank you so much for that. And if you guys want to grab a set of those as well at a discount, I will have that in the description as well with the discount code included.
All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today's video. Peace out and have some great games this week. Have a good one, everybody. See you later.